stand together. I'm looking forward to that good singing. Let's do it together. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, His empire shall bring. And joy to the nations when Jesus us is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised. I bow my knee where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. Your glory fills the highest place. What could separate me now? Isn't it good to know that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us? neither life nor death nor heaven nor earth. You go
blessings, Lord, that you've bestowed on us. Lord, we're so undeserving, and Lord, we're acutely aware of that, Lord. Lord, I pray that in this time that you will bless these tithes, these offerings. Lord, I pray that we'll give from them freely, joyfully. Lord, I pray that you'll bless them, and Lord, take them and further your kingdom here on the earth. It's in your son's name that we pray. Before we um, sing again, I wanted to say something real quickly. Um, I don't often comment on the sermons because I can't, there's not a way I can add anything to what you said this morning because that was, that was awesome. That was so good. But I just wanted to let you as a congregation know that I'm just amazed at how many times I've heard pastors and ministers who are so humble to stand behind this desk that they feel that they are not adequate to do it. And he kind of made mention about not feeling real great about it, but I just want to say, and he's not going to listen to this, but our pastor is one of the best preachers I've ever worked with. Amen. That's good. 
Amen. Now, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that for him. I'm just saying that, that it's because it's true. I've never known a pastor who works as hard, who studies as hard, and then makes it sound like he's just up here talking. And the next thing we know, we have learned something that's just absolutely amazing. Not only is he a good preacher, he's an amazing pastor. And it's uh, such a privilege uh, worshiping with him and you together. But it's not about you. So I want to invite you to stand and let's sing about the one that we have come to worship. Our King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, your name is power. Your name is mine. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is mine. Jesus, your name is healing. Jesus, your name gives sight. Your name is life. Jesus, your name is holy. Jesus, your name brings life. Jesus, your name above every other. Jesus, your name. Jesus, your name is life. Jesus, your name is life. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.
blessed us. Father, you ask for so little. Father, I pray that you will just convict us and move us to the point that we surrender everything. Father, that we do it on our own accord, not because you make us do it, not because you expect us to do it, but Father, because we love you so much that we want to do it. Father, we love you so much. Father, thank you for the way that you speak to our hearts, and I pray that you will be with our pastor as he preaches tonight, Father. Lord, it's just uh, as we learn from you tonight. Father, may our outlook be changed. May our lives be changed. May our hearts be changed. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. It's in your very precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for that singing. And I believe you did sing. Amen. And I'll deal with you at the end of the service, brother. Yes, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, we continue to think about trusting God. And tonight we're going to learn some lessons about trusting God from nature. There are a couple of places in this passage that I just want to call your attention to very shortly tonight because I know we have a lot of things to do. But uh, think about nature's lessons that are given to us here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. Don't worry, he says. That's the second or third time he said it in this passage saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles or pagans seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. 
Now I want you to think first of all with me tonight about what he's doing for us in this passage in the way of remembrance. He's reminding us of a couple of ideas and in the world that we live in. And it is the world that troubles us. Amen? And if we just didn't have to live with people, we'd be in great shape. And, uh, but that's not the way God has designed things. This world and the organized system that opposes God in that sense, the physical world, the animal world, the human world, all of this world that we're thinking about, all can confuse and cause worry. But the writer here, who happens to be Jesus, is saying, don't worry, and let me tell you why. Now, the first lesson that we're learning here is the value of the physical world. There is value in this physical world. I, I for one, think that ecologists and tree huggers are going too far. And yet they have a right concern. Did you know that Christians ought to be concerned about ecology? We ought to be concerned about pollution. We ought to be concerned about this physical world that we live in. Because it's valuable. And I think that's what Jesus is telling us right here. I don't want you to worry, so let me remind you that I take care of the world. Oh, we have extremists these days who are saying that uh, give us another 20 years. Well, it was 12 years. I don't know what it is now, but you know, that we're just going to fry all of us up because it's getting so hot. Scriptures tell us, though, that as long as this world stands, there will be springtime and summer and fall and winter. And that God has this in hand. Why? Because God values the world too. I hear people really getting upset. And, and young people, your minds are being um, filled with these ideas that we are absolutely, totally destroying this world. I got news for you. Adam started that way back when. And sin, when it entered into this world, began a corrupting process that still continues today. And the physical world was part of that. But I, I would remind you that our God cares enough that his purposes are going to be fulfilled. And God is going to see to it that this world lasts long enough to get all of his work done just the way that he intends for it to. And that God is not so unconcerned and so far away from us as to just leave this physical world spinning on its own. He cares. God cares about his creation too much to do that. I hear mayors in Jackson talk about social problems such as poverty that leads to crime now that's true y'all know it's true but let me tell you why poverty is there in the first place why crime is there in the second place it is because of a depraved heart of man and it is a social issue <laughs> But deeper than that, it's a spiritual issue. And when we get all upset about ecology and pollution and uh, taking care of this world, i got to tell you, that's a spiritual issue too. That if you want to be right with God, you will take care of this world. I grew up with a dad. Bless his heart, he worked for the Department of Transportation. When I was a kid, we'd be riding down the road and he'd be drinking a soda pop and we'd get... Uh, finished with that soda pop, he just rolled that window down. Just throw it out the window. Whether it was returnable or not, of course, when I was a kid, I could make money picking those things up. Y'all wouldn't know anything about that. But I used to say, Dad, you know, you're not supposed to pollute. He says, oh, don't worry about it, son. I work for the Department of Transportation. I'll be the one to pick it up. <laughs> 
We grew up out on the farm and uh, understood what it meant to have clean water. We understood what it meant to have a healthy environment. We understood all of those things, and we had this tremendous respect for the physical world. And in a lot of ways, people are losing out on that these days. And they don't quite understand what's going on. But I tell you, God understands, and God values His creation. And he values the physical world. Now, how do I know that? Well, I can read back over in the scriptures and it says something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Did you know that that's one of the reasons why we like to say that humanity is so valuable? Is that we are a creation of God, right? We're a unique creation of God. But so, too, is the world. The world is valuable. This, this earth that we live on, this blue globe that floats in, in nothingness is valuable to God because he created it. We know that it's valuable not only because he created it, but a, a second theological premise that is, is well known in theological circles concerning our ecology of the world is not only the value of this world because of creation, but because of the sustained order that we see in this world. God proves to us that he loves this creation, that he values this creation because of the sustained order that he sees to. He sees to it that this world keeps spinning. He sees to it that we have rain in the rainy seasons and dry in the dry seasons and snow in the cold seasons and all of the other things that we think about. Who do you think tells the trees to bud out when it's time to do it? God does. And he is not a tree hugger, but he loves trees. He loves the world. And we know that because he created it and because he sustains it. We also know that because of this universal corruption and the redemption of the world that is promised in Scripture. I'd have to read to you uh, over in uh, Romans chapter 8. Y'all know that is just a chapter that is so full of stuff. Wonderful chapter. And you go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 20. And it says something like this, the, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now now that that's just lets me know that when man fell and sin entered into this world so too did corruption and the problems that we see in the physical world today are a result of sin and the only solution to it is a savior jesus christ but that's a side issue the truth is that God is saying to us that he values the physical world so much so that it will even enjoy the benefits of redemption. We read in scripture that one of these days this world will be remade, remanufactured, reshaped, and it will be tried by fire. The very elements of this world will melt but then we see that Scripture promises that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. So if that's what God started with in the first place, and we corrupted it, but God sent Jesus Christ into this world to fix the physical world as well, does it not tell you that God loves the physical world? I believe it does. And he says, think about the grass. Think about this grass or the lilies of the field that grow today in God's green uh, pasture. And they're there today. Tomorrow they begin to wilt and dry up and wither away. But they dry and men gather them and they cast them into a furnace. 
He says, do you think they work? Do they toil? Do they spend? No. And what God is communicating to us at that point, the Lord Jesus himself in red letter stuff says, listen, I care about the physical world, but how much more do I care about you? And if the lilies don't worry, why should you? Trust God. Now, not only does he talk about the value of the physical world, but he also talks about the value of the animal world. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of people in the world today who are loving animals too much. I'm going to just tell you, they do. It's detrimental sometimes. They love animals. And, and let me tell you that that is a good thing. It is a good thing that people love animals. Did you know that God loves the animal world as well? He does. And uh, he, uh, he tells us about that back over in, in Psalms. In, in chapter 8, or the 8th Psalm rather, in verse 3. I wanted to read that a while ago, and I'm going to read that, and then I'm going to skip over. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you would visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor. Speaking to the physical world. But he also speaks to the animal world as well in Psalm 36 and verse 5. He says, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like a great mountain. Your judgments are great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. You preserve beast. And he's got that right alongside of man. And he says, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. And so the psalmist even there is putting together these two ideas that God loves the animal world, but he loves you more. And if he will take care of the animal world, he will surely take care of you. Amen? And Jesus said it like this back over here in Matthew. He said, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? What's the answer to that question? Yes. And don't let anyone ever tell you differently. You are more valuable than the physical world. You are more valuable than the animal world. As a matter of fact, as we were reading in Psalm just a moment ago, in the 8th Psalm, he says that we for a little while have been made lower than even the angels, implying though and stating clearly in other places that one of these days we will even rule and reign over the angels. Now what is his point? His point is the physical world is valuable to God. He loves it. He created it. He sustains it. And he redeems it. What about the animal life? God created animal life. And he sustains these animals, just the little birds of the air. He feeds them. And he redeems. Oh, not in the same sense that he redeems us by the blood of the Lamb and gives us eternal life, but he removes the curse of corruption. And so now here's your conclusion. Can y'all believe that? It's 639, and I use that ugly word, conclusion. But here's the point. God values the physical world. God values animal life. Jesus says right here, if God is so careful to take good care of the physical world, and God is so careful to take good care 
of the little birds. Four, five sparrows for two pennies. How much more so is he going to take care of you? Amen. And his point, therefore, do not worry. <laughs> do you know that ang one, one person has says, said that anxiety is a barometer of one's God. Anxiety is a barometer of one's God. Those with anxiety about life worship money. While those without anxiety worship the providing God. I just have to ask you tonight, who is your God? Where do you place your trust? And the answer to where you put your trust is going to be a barometer to tell us what really is your God and maybe why you worry or why you don't. Worry, according to Jesus in these verses, once again, verse 26, he said it's just unnecessary. You don't have to do it. In verse 27, he says, it's useless. It will not gain you one bit of height or length of life. He says that it is, is blind in verse 28, 29. Why are you worrying? Look, open your eyes and consider. Maybe it's because we worry because we are not looking around and seeing the great God that we have. And worry is a lack of faith, according to verse 30. You say, ah, but if I don't worry about it and I don't work hard, nobody's going to take care of me. That's your problem. You're not trusting God. Now, did you see in here a statement about Solomon? Y'all see his name in there? You got to read everything in this passage, don't we? Because this is Jesus, the master teacher, talking. And we read about Solomon, and he, he says, Do you know, if you will look at these beautiful lilies of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow, blossom and bloom out, and so beautiful. Why, Solomon, in all of his glory, was never dressed in such finery. Did you read that? What is he saying there? Let me suggest something to you right there. Who was Solomon, by the way? Some of you may not know that cat. Well, he's an Old Testament saint. He's the king who followed David. And God said, Solomon, what would you have me to do for you? And he said, oh, that I have wisdom. And so God said, good answer and it gave him wisdom and everything else that goes with it now there is an enigma in scripture because it also says he had a thousand wives whoops he didn't use his wisdom very well did he but he had it he asked for it and God gave it Solomon extended the kingdom of God on this earth under his rule and reign to the greatest extension that Israel has ever had. And he is the guy that the queen comes riding into town one day and says, oh, I, I had heard about the glories of this guy, but I didn't believe it till I saw it. And the truth is the half had not been told. Wow, what a guy. Now, Jesus says, you Christian, you're worrying. You're not trusting God. So think about this. Solomon, man, why would he ever have to worry? He's a billion, billion, billionaire in Old Testament standards. He could have anything he wanted. Did he worry? Yeah, he worried. <laughs> But he had all of that stuff and all of the regality and all of the finery. And Jesus said, I tell you that, that he was never dressed so fine as this plant in my physical world that I take care of. What's that got to do with me, Jesus? 
Well, in some way, I'm convinced that he is telling us, if you'll look at the Old Testament saints, and we can see how good God was to them, what Jesus is saying for the New Testament saint, you've got it better. I don't know how to explain that to you, how to communicate it to you. But what I'm understanding in this passage is that I, as a New Testament saint, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ will be provided for better in some ways than even God did for the Old Testament saint Solomon. Wow. Wow. That's just kind of flabbergasting, isn't it? That is so far out there. Some of you are saying, well, Brother Mal, that's got to be pinionology. I don't think it is. Why would he bring Solomon up? And why would he be doing it in address to New Testament people? There's a comparison there, I think. You say, yeah, but Brother Mal, and and we'll close with this. Brother Mal, I know people who are Christians, and it doesn't seem like they've been provided for. I'll never know anybody who claimed to be a Christian and yet starved to death. Did you know there have been some? How does that jive with Scripture? Ooh, I backed myself in a corner now, hadn't I? I have. But let me tell you how all this ties together. Who is it that God gave dominion over the physical world when he created it? Huh? Man? That's exactly right. God created the heavens and the earth, and he dressed it, and he tended it, and he made a beautiful garden. And then he created Adam and Eve, and he put them in the garden and said, there. Tended. And he gave them dominion over the world. Not only did they have dominion over that garden with all of that beautiful mineral resources and, and uh, fauna that was growing, but they also were instructed this way. They said, you have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. And so who was given dominion in the Old Testament over the animal life? Man. Now let me carry you on down to that third little statement. You and I were given dominion by the very hand of God in the physical realm. You and I have been given dominion and responsibility over animal life. And the animal kingdom. But I'd have to tell you that God also, just as he worked through humans in those first two areas, continues to work through humans in the provision for other people. And so let me make this statement so that you kind of begin to to pull it together. If you knew someone that claimed to be a Christian... And yet they suffered from want. They had to beg for their bread. Ultimately starved to death. Would that be God's fault? No. It would not be God's fault. Because God is a providing God. But what God does to provide for his children is ask his other children to take care of the lesser children. Now, nobody in here probably wanted to hear me preach a message about ecology and our responsibility not to pollute the world, but it's true. As a Christian, it is our responsibility to take care of God's green earth. Nobody probably wanted to hear that we were responsible for the well-being and the caretaking of, of animals in this world. But it's true. Why? Because God values both and he's put us in charge. 
But God, very clearly, according to Jesus in this passage, loves humanity more than he loves the animals. He loves humanity more than he loves the physical world. And if it seems that God has failed in taking care of humanity, I have to tell you it is not God's failure, but it is ours. Just as surely as it is our failure to take care of God's green earth and the animals that run to and fro. Why? Because God values all. But Jesus is trying to point out to us, why are you worrying so much? I love you more than I love the created world. And it's been standing for years. Last time I checked, I know for a fact it's been here for at least 61 years. Looks like it's going to make it another year or two. No, it's much older than that. God has kept it because he provides. And God has kept the animal life just the way he wants it through mankind and God is leaning on us in a very real sense he is trusting us he is commissioning us to take care of the less fortunate if somebody is going hungry in this world shame on me y'all hear that now do we believe it Oh, but if Christians could just be busy doing what God's called us to do. Busy loving not just the physical world and the animal world, but loving humanity. I think we could probably say that we're going to take care of every Christian on the face of this earth. And they won't go without food. They won't go without clothing. We could do that. But we don't. But that's not God's failing. It is ours. Now, what do you need to worry about? Don't worry about God failing you. (laughs) Worry about your own failures if you're going to worry. But let it be a worry that brings you to the feet of the cross, to the foot of the cross, to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you more than he loves this world, and it still stands. He loves you more than the animals, and they still live. He loves you. And Jesus said over and again, because of this, you trust God and stop worrying. Father, would you help us as we enter into a time of invitation? May be that there's somebody in this room that just needs to kneel at the altar and say, God, forgive me for worrying and being anxious. And Father, I want to just lay everything at your feet and leave it there. Maybe there's somebody in this room, Father, that realizes we've been failing our brothers and our sisters in want and that you've been wanting to provide for their needs And you wanted to do it through me and through other people, and we haven't done it. Oh, Father, forgive us for that grievous sin. Help us to see people where they are in their need and help meet those needs, Father. It's the Christian thing to do. Oh, Father, if there's another decision, may it be made here tonight for your glory and your praise. May you be honored in it all. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing, and we're going to sing for just a moment. You come.